All right, good morning. Are we ready to open up God's Word this morning? Grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're in our series um, that we're playfully calling the greatest of these. And chapter 13, if you remember from last week, is the love chapter and where Paul is telling us, it's sandwiched in between this idea that we are, we are all gifted and we're part of God's family and each one of us has a special role to play. And then Paul goes into this, this discourse, this conversation about love, and it's probably the greatest chapter ever written on love. Last week, he laid the foundation by telling us, look, if, if you can speak in all kinds of different languages or have all, all the knowledge of heaven and earth and faith that can move mountains, if you're even the best person who ever walked the planet, you give not only your finances, but you give yourself. If you do all of those things, but you do not have love, what do you have? Nothing. You have nothing. You have nothing. You are nothing. You've gained nothing. Love is what makes the world go round. It's what fuels our Christian faith. Everything we do is founded on love. That's a great place to start. And Paul now shifts to probably the most famous part of this chapter. It's the part that we hear in weddings every time we go to a wedding. And Paul, in this next section, these next few verses, verses 4 through 7, tells us what love is. He tells us what love is not. He tells us what love does. And he tells us what love does not do. Remember... The quieter you are, the longer I go today. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even get the joke for a second, Matt. Matt's just going to be, re- you're going to hear a lot of Matt now. He's ready to go. It's almost time for some football, right? But here's the thing. As I started to, to look into this passage, this is one of the most difficult passages. I told my team, I think I even told some others, some friends, this is one of the most difficult passages to teach on. And I want to tell you kind of why. And I'm going to start in, in an unusual way. I'm going to put a picture up on the screen. What is this? Those of you who can't see, I'll get out of here. This chess. How many chess players do I have in the room? Right? How many good chess players do I have in the room? Oh, most of you left your hands up. I will see you after service. <laughs> Here's the thing about chess. How many of you uh, have learned, learned chess from a friend or maybe a family member? Okay. You remember the first time you played chess? And those of you who don't play chess, why don't you play chess? <laughs> because it's stupid? Who said stupid? Why, why is it stupid? My mother said it's stupid. Why is it stupid? Because it doesn't make any sense. Those of you who don't play chess, why don't you play chess? Because it's hard. There's, there's a bunch of rules, right? The pieces don't move in ways you think they should move. This piece moves one except for the first time. Then it can move two. And there's this weird, if you don't, in passant, where if you go so far and then they move up, you can take a piece sideways, right? Some of them kill diagonally. Some of them kill straight forward. You got the little L piece, the funky L piece, right? The knight, it can move in an L, two, and one, and it, it's the only one that can jump. Nothing else can jump, but that one can jump. There's all these weird rules. At the end of the day, it's hard. Mom, pick a different word. Not stupid, just hard. <laughs> it's a difficult game. But once you, be, once you learn the rules, oh, it can become kind of addicting, right? I mean, this is a logic-based game. In fact, the longer you play it, the more you realize how little you know about this game. But it is all about logic, right? And understanding the rules, and you can begin to learn strategies, and you can learn openings and gambits and what our end game is, and, and you can watch a Netflix show about it, right? The, the Queen's Gambit. This is a, a game that has been around. I actually watched a little history on chess this week. It's a game that's been around for a long time. They're not even quite sure how it got to its current form. But this is a hard game. This takes a lifetime to learn because it's all logic-based. So I want you to just put that in your brain for a second and let's logically look at one of the most complicated... Here, here's where the connection is. At the end of the day, once you learn the rules, is chess really simple? Once you learn the rules, is chess really simple? Yeah. 
But is it also complicated? Yeah. Are you going to master it in a week? Nope. Are, are you going to go on YouTube and watch a couple of videos and all of a sudden you're going to be a grandmaster at chess? No, it's going to take a lifetime. In fact, when I sit down and play somebody, I love teaching children how to play chess. You know why? You can dominate them. And it makes you feel better about yourself. But you ever sat down with somebody who actually knows how to play? And in about three moves, you're like, uh-oh. This isn't going to be as simple as, it, as I thought it was going to be. See, chess is one of those games that can take a lifetime to master. And some of us don't even try because it's too hard. Well, our topic this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is, is love is the same way. Love is very complicated. Love is a difficult topic to, to, to discuss. So let's, let's see, let's kind of break down how Paul describes love. He says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Amen? Powerful. In fact, and we can start to break, break this uh, section down kind of logically. In fact, you can begin to do an analysis of what Paul is talking about here. Again, I've talked about it. He says that love is some things, and then he says love is not some things. He says love does some things, and then love does not do some things. He's got a whole set of positive and negatives. In fact, you can take this passage and break it down into its positive and negative attributes. These are the things that love does. Love is patient and kind. It does not keep a record of wrong. It rejoices with truth, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Those are the things that love does. These are the things that love does not do. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud or rude or self-seeking or easily angered. And it does not delight in evil. That's a pretty good list. Now, what should be logically, what should be the next thing we should do with this, with this passage? Do it. <laughs> do it. Yes, in fact, that's the challenge of me teaching this. Because I got to the end of reading this and doing my study, and I'm like, well, here's, here's the message. Here's the message. Do these things and don't do these things. Let's go home. <laughs> if only it were that simple, right? Amen. I mean, do we know these things? Amen. Yeah. How you doing on doing yeah, see, and I know that you know these things, and I know that you know that you're not doing these things very well, and I know that you know that I know that, and you'd like me to tell you how to do these things better so that you and I would all know that we're doing it better. See my problem? How do I tell you to do something that Paul has already told you to do that Jesus has already told you to do? So I, I okay, so... My logical brain, remember my chest brain says, okay, what I need to do is do more study. So what are some ways we could do more study and break this down even further? Do some other analysis. Dictionary. Right? Read other passages, get the dictionary. Right, so let's break these. So I did that. I actually got several different uh, passages or versions of scripture out. You know, uh, this is new living, which, you know, there's kind of two scales of interpretation. There's one that says, Thought for thought. I'm trying to give the idea of what the original author was saying. And then there's word for word. Now just give me the exact words that the author is giving. And somewhere in the middle is like the NIV. So New Living is on this end. NIV is right in the middle. ESV or New American Standards is on this end. So I read them all. And you know what that did? It made it worse. It didn't give me the same list. That's what I thought it would do. But what it did was it gave me different sentence structure so different versions actually clump these things together differently. And well, at least it'll give me different words or the same words, right? So I'll, nope, you know what it did? Aside from patient and kind, every single one of these was different. But listen to the ESV. I mean, just how it puts it together. Love is patient and kind. Woo, good there. Does not envy or boast, is not arrogant or rude. General ideas, does not insist on its way is on its own way, is not irritable or resentful. I don't even see irritable or resentful there. 
It, it does not rejoice with wrong, but rejoices with truth. And then here you get to this end part. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then it even brings a section, verse 8, that's not even in the New Living Translation. Love never gives up. That just confused me more. Said, oh, great. So I've got to teach this thing like 14 different ways. And, okay, not only am I going to look at different versions, what should I really do? Okay, forget the different translations. What should we really do? Yeah, go to the Greek. Let's study the real words. And so I went and I did a, this deep study, which is why you pay me the big bucks, right? To do this study and then tell you what it said. So you don't have to do it, right? I, I know how this game works. So I did that. I went through all of these. And you know what they mean? They mean all the things all the versions say. And we, we have words in our language that are so frustrating. And English is worse, right? Right? You know what one of the worst words is? Let me give you a quick example. How about the word bat? What can the word bat mean in the English language? It's an animal, right? The bat that flies and eats all the mosquitoes and you love and have a hate-love-hate relationship and probably turn you into a vampire at some point. What else can it mean? Baseball. Baseball, yeah, baseball bat. And even then, it's the, the thing, right? And it's the action. So you can hold the bat so that you can bat. A bat. See how crazy our language is? You know what one of the most difficult words is? Love. Love. Love can mean all kinds of different things. You can love cheeseburgers. <laughs> and you can love your wife. They better not be the same. <laughs> it, it's a tough one. I mean, whole philosophies... Books, poems, songs, sonnets have been written on this. And Paul's going to describe it in 16 different explanations. Here's our problem with attacking love the way I want to attack it. And here's what I want to do as a pastor and as a teacher and as a preacher. I want you to walk away and have something that you know and that you can do something with. Right? I want to teach you something that you can do. Which means i got to attack this thing logically and give you A, B, C, and D. Here's the problem. Uh, I, one more picture. See, that's very left brain logic oriented, right? But would you say love is left brain or right brain? Right. I mean, just look at the words. Uh, love. You see, love is even there. Uh, poetry, passion, creativity, yearning. Does that sound more like love or is it more practical, strategic, logic? Give me a rule and I'll follow it and that's what love is. This is what gets men and women in trouble, by the way. Because men, how do we typically approach love? How do women? Now, I know I'm being, I know I'm being stereotypical. I know that. Please don't write me an email. I, I'm just saying in general, I know there are exceptions to every rule, all right? But we typically approach it this way and women, how do you typically approach it? <laughs> the right way, she said. <laughs> the correct way, with the right brain. Right? We think if we screw up, we bring you flowers, you should forgive us. That's an equation. Right? It's strategic, it's practical. We know the rules, we follow the rules. And you can do, one day you can do that and it works, and the next day you do it and it doesn't. Because love doesn't make sense. Love is not a left brain activity. It is a right brain. Love is art, not logic. So let's look at some art. Would you like to look at some art? Yes. No, you would not. Okay, what's this one? Oh, Mona Lisa. Who painted the Mona Lisa? Leonardo da Vinci, somewhere around 15, early 1500s. Why is the Mona Lisa so popular? Yeah, we don't know. Because her smile is weird, right? I've actually watched people analyze this painting and they say it's actually from a technical perspective, it's a terrible work of art. Like the planes, the, 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 the things in the background don't line up. The horizon doesn't line up. It's higher on this side than it is on this side. And where is she looking anyway? And the smile, come on. And the hands don't even look right. Why does this enrapture people so much? I don't know. 
All right, let me show you a different one. How about this one? This is by Vermeer, the girl with a pearl earring. This painting, everyone get a good look at it? Yeah. Is this painting amazing? Yes. Yeah, this painting is worth millions of dollars. Millions of dollars! I don't get it. How about this one? Yeah. Van Gogh's Starry Night. Doesn't he really look like anything, right? Worth millions of dollars. Oh, yeah, this one. What's this one? Salvador Dali. Dude went off the rails, right? I mean, he's got clocks that are melting and, and little ant things going on here, and I don't understand this. Again, worth millions of dollars. Because this is all, this is not objective, this is subjective. It begins to work in a different part of our brains. And right back to this point, love is art. It's not logic. It's not science-based. And here's the problem, is we approach love the way I want to approach it. We approach this passage the way I want to approach it, and we're going to miss the point. We're going to miss everything. So you don't study love. You don't analyze love. You ponder love. You ponder love deeply. In fact, Scripture gives us an example of this. Mary, when Jesus was born at Christmas, I mean, Christmas seems like it was forever ago, right? We're talking a couple weeks ago. Scripture says Mary, you know, the, the shepherds had come and they were, they, were, they were amazed by everything that had happened. There was all this little commotion that evening and the shepherds went away. And what did Mary do with all of that, that stuff? She pondered it deeply in her heart. So here's my challenge is I give you this list and what I want to tell you is do these things and don't do these things. But can I let you in on a secret as I began to study this passage? Not one time does Paul tell us to do these things. Verses four through seven, there is not a directive, an imperative, a command given in these verses. He does not say, love is patient, therefore, be patient. He does not tell us to be patient. He does not say, I want you to be kind. He does not say, I want you to stop keeping a record of wrongs. Now, we can say, our, our left brain says, but it's implied. Now, is it implied? Yes. But is he telling us to do those things? Now, what is he telling us? He's painting a picture. He's painting a picture in words about what love is and what it isn't, what it does and what it doesn't do. And the answer is not for us to analyze love. What should we do? We're not supposed to look at these things and say, ah, oh, man, I messed that one up yesterday. Did I mess that one up yesterday? Probably. probably. <laughs> Did you hear my wife said Probably. She'll give me a list how later, right? <laughs> and if you ask your wife or you ask your husband, well, can they give you a list of how you messed this stuff up? Yeah. And should we be doing that self-analysis? Yes. But I think we need to do that second. The first thing we need to do is to ponder love deeply. To begin to understand love. Now, how did, what did we start talking off, start talking about? Chess. Chess. Now, are there rules to chess? Yes. Is chess a logic-based game? Yes. But when you start talking to and listening to the grandmasters, those who are the very best of the very best of the very best, do they simply follow the rules? What do they actually start to do? They start to break those rules. And they start to do things that people call innovative and creative and they do things that don't make sense. In fact, once they've learned the rules, now they know which rules they can break and when they can break them. If we always followed a set of rules in chess, what would we have? It'd be a robotic game. It wouldn't be fun. The point is that there is some creativity in the game itself. It's very difficult, but what makes it really challenging and why people can play it their entire lives is because there is a sense of wonder and creativity baked into the game. 
What does that have to do with what we're talking about? Well, at some point, you've got to learn the rules, but you also need to ponder things deep inside of us. There's a, we need to tap into a part of ourselves that maybe we don't tap into very often. Men, look at me. I am more talking to you than to the women in the room. Yeah, you and I need to ponder love, not always analyze it. So I'm going to give you a weird homework assignment. I'm not asking you to go do anything on this list. What I want you to do is consider and ponder each thing on this list as it is a description of what love is. Now, if you want to get really crazy... Here's, how many of you have ever read Song of Solomon? Okay, it's kind of weird that it's in our Bibles, right? And if you're going to read, have your kids read it, have them read it in the King James. Not in a new version, because they might understand it in the new version. And then you might have a lot of explaining to do. What is Song of Solomon about? It's about love. It's about every kind of love. The, the, the gamut of love from passion and lust and eroticism to friendship and, and this deep agape love that we're talking about here. And, and Song of Solomon, if you listen to the description that the writer of the Song of Solomon and the, the primary, the main character in Song of Solomon is giving to this beautiful woman that he loves and he begins to describe this woman. Have you ever seen the depiction of what that woman would look like if it was real? It's horrendous. But like teeth with pillars and uh, hair flowing like she a sheep mane. If you depict that as being literal, it's disgusting. Is he being literal? No, he's being figurative. He's being poetic. He's giving license. So we need to be a little poetic and creative and think about love and what love is and what it isn't in a different way. So maybe here's your assignment. That if you're going to go do anything this week, if you need an activity this week, take this list and draw some art based on this description of love. And some of you just tapped out. <laughs> Not going to happen. And, and here's, here's two reasons why. Men, I know especially you gave... One or both of these reasons. Somebody tell me the number one reason why people say, I'm not going to go home and draw this. I can't draw. I didn't, see, I didn't ask you to put it in an art gallery, but just go draw it. No one needs to see it. You can burn it afterwards. That was one excuse. I can't draw. Don't let that be an excuse. Just give yourself over to the experience. And the second part is, it feels weird. It just feels weird. And I wouldn't even know where to begin to do this. That's the point. See, because we begin to approach this from a very left brain attitude instead of a right brain attitude. In fact, even me standing, can I just be honest and transparent with you for a second? Even me standing here talking about this, I feel weird. And I'm like, I'm going to go home. Here, I, I'm going to tell you right now what's going to happen when I get in my car and begin to drive home. What was I thinking? And then why didn't Jake talk me out of it? Why didn't I let Amy teach this? She's a woman after all. She'd probably have a better range at it. And they're never going to want me back to do another topic again. Because they're, they think this is ridiculous. You know why I think you think I'm going to think it's ridiculous? Because I think it's ridiculous. That was my struggle as I began this. Paul, just tell me what to do. Right? Okay, now... I am going to give you a little bit of help. Are you ready? So here's how you can begin to ponder this description of love beyond the go and do these things. And in some ways I feel relieved because how do I tell you to be patient? I don't know. As soon as I figure it out, I'll let you know. All, all I know about patience is what? Do not pray for God to give you patience. Patience. Because God will give you every opportunity to demonstrate patience. That's not what I'm asking you to do. Here's number one. I'm going to give you four things that you can do. Number one is ask yourself, how did Jesus demonstrate these characteristics of love in his life? Think about Jesus. 
How did Jesus demonstrate patience? How was Jesus not rude? When were there instances in Jesus' life when he had an opportunity to be proud or rude or boastful and he didn't take it? What did he do anyway? Analyze. If you need to analyze anything, analyze the one who came to demonstrate how we do it. How did Jesus demonstrate these descriptors of love? And then the second question you can ask is, how does God demonstrate these things in your life? Let me ask you this. Has God been patient with you? Man, he's, he's patient with me more than I deserve. Is, is God, does God protect you? Does he have hope about you? Now, some of these questions you're going to get to, and you're going to be like, man, I don't know. Does God keep a record of wrongs? Hmm. See, we think he does, right? I mean, God's up there waiting. (laughs) I can't wait till Linda messes up. (laughs) Wham! Got her. I can't wait till Matt speaks twice in service. (laughs) Bam! I got him. But is that actually what God is doing? No. God wants the very best in our lives. God trusts you. He wants, he, 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 he believes in you. He wants to protect you and give you the very best. How has God demonstrated these things in your life? And then as analytical as I want you to get this week, ask yourself, what are your strengths and weaknesses on this list? When you look at this list, what are you good at and what are you not good at? Where do you do well and what should you do with the things you do well? You can't do more of those things. And the things you're not doing well, I want you to go back to question number one. How did Jesus do these things? I wear this wristband. What would Jesus do? What would he do in that situation? You find yourself in a spot where you're questioning your, you know, whether it's a spouse or a child or a coworker or something else in your life. How would Jesus respond in this situation? I'm not very good. I tend to be, I'm, this isn't me. I'm just going to pretend for a second. Let's say I tend to be rude. Somebody says something to me, boom, I hit them. Oh, it feels so good when you get a good zinger out, doesn't it? And we just talk about it in our family. The way we show love is we zing you. If, if we're not getting on your case a little bit, you should be worried. Maybe there's a better way, Right? And here's the last thing, and this is number four for a reason. How can you begin to put these things into practice? But here's the deal. You got this list, but you have to ponder them before you practice them. You have to understand at a different, in a different part of your brain, in a different part of your spirit, what love is, what it is not, what it does and what it does not do. And you need to just sit in that and let God soak it and bake it into you. It's, it's like a marinade. Any of you remember having terrible steak growing up? I think my grandparents would do chop steak. You know what chop steak is? I literally think they put thread in it. It's disgusting. You ever had a pot roast that you're just like, Ugh. it's as dry as it can be, right? How do you fix all steak? You marinate it and you let it cook slowly. Now, Jake's going to call me later and say, except for this steak. You don't want to do that to this steak. I'm just saying meat in general. If you, if you marinate it in something delicious and you cook it as slow as you can, is it going to be okay? How many of you are hungry right now? Yeah, I'm getting hungrier. I think it's the same way with love. All of these things are true, but they need to marinate in us a little bit. They need to cook inside of us for a while. You, these things, some of these things do not come naturally. You need to ponder them. If, you're, if you tend to be rude, you need to sit on that for a minute and let God work on that in your heart and in your life. One message on a Sunday morning is not going to change it. I wish it could. <clears throat> and that's what I had to come to grips with this week. I can't change this in me, much less in you. But if I let God begin to, if I sit in this and meditate on it and ponder it and let God begin to do this work in me, now everything begins to change. Once I've pondered it, then I can put it into practice. And that's my challenge for us this week. And I know I did not say this as well as I'd like to have said it. I wish I could have given you something a little bit different this morning. I wish I'd have finished 18 minutes earlier. 
But is any of that true? No. So what I've really done is give you an opportunity to demonstrate love to me. Right? Be patient. Don't be rude. Don't be self-seeking. Don't get angry. Be kind. Don't keep a record of wrong and rejoice with the truth. Not my truth. God's truth. Ponder love deeply this week. And then go put it into practice. Let's stand and pray. Father, this morning, you know, I wrestled with how even to have this conversation because it's not in my wheelhouse, but it is in yours. And I trust your spirit to take anything I've said and more importantly, take your words out of your book and apply it deeply, let it plant it deeply into the hearts and minds of your people. Father, let us this week ponder love. Ponder and consider how Jesus loved, how you love us. And then begin to look internally. How are we loving? What are the areas where we need to work on? And we need to sit in that and let your spirit work on us a little bit. And then begin to put that into practice. And I wonder in my own life, Father, if I don't try and reach out, try and love a little too soon before I'm ready. Kind of like if I sat down at a chessboard with a grandmaster and said, okay, I'm going to win this one. I got some work to do first. And I want to love the people around me and do the very best I can. And in the midst of that process, Father, I just pray that you begin to change our hearts with your word, with your love. And thank you for loving us. Thank you for demonstrating this and giving us an example of perfect love. Let us ponder love deeply this week. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us in person and online.